Welcome to Still Untitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Will. I'm Adam. And I'm Norm. Hey, welcome back, guys. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah. As was promised, we took a week off last week, mm-hmm. and you've been taking some time off, Adam. I have. Uh, my wife and I did a road trip down to Laguna Beach, California, Ooh. where some friends are staying for uh, a month, and we stayed with them for a few days. Nice. What, what? I fi- uh, uh, five or 101? Um, five. Okay. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I, so I did that 101 trip last, not last time I went to LA, but the time before that. And it is it is such a pleasant way to drive back. 101 is the shizzle. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. You we can... just happened to be, five was much more convenient for going around rather than through. and Makes sense. Yeah. Making the time that we wanted to make on the way home. Um, but it's beautiful down there. Uh, we brought the weather with us. It had apparently been rainy mm. just before we arrived, but it was gorgeous. Uh, yeah, I'm enjoying some real time off. This is actually, as soon as we're done here, I'm going back to hanging out and not doing much. I know, yours. this is still vacation time for you, so thank you for yes. coming in. Oh, yeah. yeah well, we... I had, I, truth be told, I had a couple of hours of work to do this morning recording the last voiceovers for the last two episodes of Savage Builds. Ooh. Yeah. I, yeah. So... Which is why my voice is just a little bit <laughs> trashed, because I have to have so much enthusiasm for the beginnings of the I, episodes. I was going to say, like, on those, on those voiceover bits, I can tell... I, I I've listened to enough normal Adam voice that you hear the you hear yeah. Adam working the voice booth uh, <laughs> uh, uh, voice. I think it's really quite impressive, actually. Just watching like the the past couple episodes, three of them are out right now, but knowing when you go from things recorded on site, yeah. and how that's produced, and how seamlessly that bleeds into the voiceover. It's it, tricky because, like Will, I can also hear the difference very starkly, um, and so actually watching the first couple of episodes, watching the first three episodes. Uh, has slightly altered how I'm recording now because I realize when I'm going into convers there's distinct differences between conversational mode. I mean, radio voice, look, podcast all, voice. All of this ends up giving me huge <laughs> amount of respect for micro and other people who are just the literal geniuses of voiceover. Oh yeah, and voice actors. Yeah, voice oh, actors. Yeah, right? no, seriously, seriously. Mark Hamill, chief among them. I I record a few. I, I record every now and then at the same studio downtown that Mike Rowe does Deadly's Catch from. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I said, how long does it take Mike to record an hour of television? And they were like 32 minutes. Wow. <laughs> so, so he does it like the, he, he runs it at 1.5 times speed I, and he, then they play it back. He's at a machine. A, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, but we have questions. Oh, yes. About okay. Savage Bill. Oh, yeah. nice. And now that we have you here, we yes. can go through them. So episode one was Iron Man. We talked about it. The suit's yep. behind us. Yep. Episode two was about the Panjandrum. Yeah. Now, <laughs> so, a word that a lot of people have trouble saying. I can't say it. Panjandrum. Panjandrum. Adam Steltzner uh, also had real difficulty saying it. We have a lot of takes of him going panandrum, panandrum. Panera. Yeah. Panandrum. No. It's it's it's, it's, a, it's a it's the words don't go to you. It's in English. Um, so I, I watched that last night. I missed it when it was out because I was out doing stuff. But I watched it last night and I was blown away because I, I like I'm not so much into the war machines side of all this stuff. Sure. But like it's a fascinating engineering challenge and the way you guys framed it was really good. Like the idea that hey this should have worked and why didn't it is yep. is really interesting. Well, and th- that's actually what happened in the meeting um, when we were putting together the original pitch deck for this episode uh, to take it to discovery. That was that was not one of my contributions. That came from Well Rock, my production company. Um, the Panjandrum. The Panjandrum. And when we started production and we started looking at, you know, sometimes you don't do anything that's in the pitch deck. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you do everything. And in this case, we did a bunch of stuff that was in the pitch deck. And that Panjandrum came about and we were talking about it, the production team and I. And they were like, you know, what's interesting to you about doing this? And I'm like, well... I mean, I, I don't want to do a whole episode just to show why it sucked. And then I started thinking about it, like, well, does it suck? And that's when I came around to that clarity of like, no, this is actually a brilliant solution. This is a really awesomely simple engineering solution. This is like a Jamie Heineman kind of solution. Yeah, it's ridiculous on the surface. But when you think about it, it's like, oh, yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Um, big obstacles, big wheels. Yeah. I mean, it's just this is what I love about engineering is sometimes the simplest solution seems the most ridiculous and then it works magnificently based on very just known principles. Yes. And this is the second episode in the season that, that highlights that because the the last episode in the season, I go down to uh, New Zealand and we attach some laser tag to some of Peter Jackson's world war one airplanes. Spoilers. (laughs) And the thing is, is 
like these are machines that we think of as primitive, but all you have to do is take a careful look at them with an engineer's eye to see that they are magnificent machines built by the smartest people on the planet at the moment they were built. State of the art at the moment they were built, yeah. And they are still not primitive. They are beautifully tuned systems built to be in the air. And when you fly in them, you can sense that. When you look at them, when you watch people assembling them, you talk to the engineers in New Zealand, putting them together, you realize how much genius there is there. And it's 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 bad thinking to go, oh, old stuff, primitive, new stuff, better. Um, the world doesn't work like that. And it's really, it's incumbent on us as scientists and engineers to kind of note, you know, the, the, how gray that line can be. And there are ways in which fabrication has certainly improved the tools oh, to which to, to make this. Sure. And that's where you feel like the difference is between something 50 years ago and 100 years ago. Absolutely. And actually, I mean, I remember at one point talking to the, the head of Peter's company a couple of years ago, the company that builds these airplanes. And I said, so you build everything to spec or above? And he goes, actually, no, we build everything to spec. And I hmm. said, why wouldn't you take advantage of modern materials? Like if you could make a fuel line out of carbon fiber or whatever magic you could impart. And he said, that's a mistake. He said, these were perfectly tuned systems where every part and the maintenance schedule was all built off of how it was put together. If I replaced one piece of this with a super strong part that would never break down, he said, I end up putting stress on another part of the system that I can't predict. And that will cause things, cascades to fail in different ways, again, that can't be predicted. So they build only to the blueprints. It's the difference between making a replica and a reproduction. Exactly. So Ford in the 80s would make reproductions of the Model T and Model A, and they were fiberglass fiberglass bodies shaped to look exactly like the originals with, I think, Pinto engines inside them. Mm. And But for all intents and purposes, it was a Pinto that looked like a Model T or a, right. or a Model A. Right. Right. If, they had, if they had replicated the Model T, it would have cost way more money, right. and it would have been a much less reliable car than the fiberglass with the with the Pinto. Well, and it, uh, there's a funny analog to this, which is when we went down to shoot um, Farewell to Arms at, at, uh, in New Zealand, the, the armor with my Arthurian armor, um, I, I went over to Peter's house one night for dinner and I brought the Arthurian armor with me because he wanted to see it up close. Mm-hmm. So there's this moment at which I said, do you want to see some armor after dinner? And he went, yes, please. I've been waiting this whole time. <laughs> and I went out to the car and I got it and I laid it out and we were laid out on a big table in his house and we we're talking about it. And I said, he said something about Arthur's armor and I said, well, it's a replica. And he went, you know, if it's built to the same design by the guy that built the original, he said, I think you're in spongier territory than simply calling it a replica. It is identical in every respect to the original thing. So it's something a bit finer. And these planes are exactly in that realm. It's 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 um, it's really cool. Oh, so I, I have a question about like, I, I feel like I have a pretty good grasp of how you would break an episode about something that you're pretty confident you know how to do, like the Mad Max episode, right? But when you're sitting down and talking about the Pangenge drum, Pangenge drum. Yeah. Oh, there, I got it. <laughs> um, I, like, how do you do, do you do testing and stuff before you decide you're going to go forward with that episode? Or do you just jump in knowing that you might fail and that the story of the failure will be as interesting as the story of a success? We, uh, we, we weren't calculating for failure. Okay. But I always wanted the show to be able to encompass that. Uh, that was we shot out of order, so that was actually the very first episode we filmed. Okay, and when it failed, I mean, I talked about this in the behind yep. the scenes ep- uh, episode I shot. Um, I was a little gobsmacked, and so was Steltzner. We're both like, "What the? Oh man, holy cow!" And then I, again, I realized, no, I want the show. I want to make is one that this can still be thrilling, even if it doesn't have the payoff. Mm. And so we didn't do a lot of preliminary testing since we were in early. I mean, we started filming that in like the second week in January, Mm. but there was not a lot of pre-pro we could have done because everyone was gone for the holidays, et cetera. Um, So we knew we were going to build the original first. That was an easy build. We built all four wheels at once. Um, We shot it slightly out of order to, you know, spread it out a little bit, but for efficiency's sake, we made a single jig and we cut and bent and welded all those wheels in one time. Um, and then, yeah, Steltzner and I just started talking back and forth and doing a lot of math by conference call to figure out the specs and the the pieces and the chunks and parts that we were needing to order. For the for the flywheel base. Yeah, for the version. flywheel driven one. That, that was a really lovely turn, by the way. 
um, the the sh- the shift from the from the rocket powered one to the it's like hey, this is this is wrapping up unusually early today. <laughs> I guess we can move on and I'll uh, have the rest of my evening. <clears throat> but but I'm specifically thinking about stuff like the run flat tires on the bike on the small scale prototype. Yeah, like you like I noticed I was looking at that I was like oh they use these solid rubber tires, presumably because the rockets are going to hit the tire and is that something that oh. like. No, that was not by that design at all. We oh, no. used run flat tires because those were the tires we could get within a couple of hours when we decided to make that <laughs> prototype really quickly. Okay. That was I think Pure that was luck. Craigslist. Oh, you know. Oh yeah. my god. Okay, so I was there like, was, there's I, I think the answer to your question is a lot less planning than you think. But it, <laughs> it's all on the screen. And it's also engineering and problem solving on a deadline. Mm-hmm. That sometimes gives you the most interesting problem solving oh, to, to solutions. All of my favorite solutions. I, I yeah. yeah, the deadline is yeah it's an incredible uh efficient mover of innovation <laughs> so so you don't you didn't do any pretests you just you just jumped in we just jumped right in and then stuff like painting spirals on the wheel or putting the lines so you can see the wheel turning the spirals again came about that morning that's, when we we're like we got to be able to see these things a little better yeah yeah, yeah. that's really it's really it's really good <laughs> holy I, well I, mean, I assume this was a finely run t- finely tuned well, machine Adam. you know i have a lot of institutional knowledge from mythbusters obviously um in which as I'm setting something up, I'm always asking when I'm looking through Scott or Duncan or Willie's cameras, is this shot telling the story clearly to the audience? Yeah. And if there's a shot in which the thing's in a distance and a flywheel is spinning at a gargantuan and terrifying speed, well, that's got to be part of the story. So the best way to do that is, oh, it's going to be a spiral, right? Yeah. These are easy progressions to make nar- uh, logically f- from a narrative standpoint. The, the flywheel... I think is the scariest thing I've ever seen you do. <laughs> it was so like so terrifying. Like, yeah, because like if any point of if any point that failed, if the axle broke, if the, one of the fasteners got well, disconnected, we, and we it, overpowered everything <clears throat> in the design to to keep that from happening. That's why I went with a truck axle and with yeah. those those kind of specs. But I mean, still, when you, when you were trying to pull the 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 speeder upper <laughs> thing off, yeah, and and then the whole thing shifted to the left, man. Oh. It could have gone real bad. Yeah, no, d- indeed. Yeah. Um, and to compound the issues that we were having, we covered the rain in the episode a bit. Yeah. But it was the wettest January, like, in 100 years in San Francisco. We kept yeah. on booking locations and then not being able to go to them because they were knee-deep in mud. And even in that episode, uh, my cruiser almost got stuck in the mud. We had all sorts yeah, you of should, you, yeah. There was a shot of something stuck oh, in the mud no, at some we point. Were, yeah. Every last one of us was tr- the filthiest we'd ever been at the end of that shoot. That's for the more prime or the frustrating roadblocks, the circumstantial stuff. Cause it, uh, yeah, it is. Because you want to get it. Yeah, it totally is. And it's uncommon in Northern California to have the weather. I mean, January is always rainy, but it's not like it was this year. In 13 years of doing Mythbusters, we never lost yeah. locations because of weather. Yeah. Ever. Huh. That just well, didn't happen. So we lost like five on this one show alone oh. <laughs> in four months. Um, so, so okay. So you talked about why the panandrum didn't work. Panjandrum. Panjandrum. <laughs> Pan, panjandrum. I'll get it by the end. Um, but, but, you know, I, I think that your test of the rocket one probably would have worked in practice, right? Like if you if you're the British if you're the if you're the British expeditionary forces storming the beaches of Normandy and you fire forty of those things off the beach, you're going to get enough of them hit and blow up to um, solve your problem. So there's an issue that again there's so much that ends up getting cut out because you yeah. can't keep telling you can't tell complex stories. You can only tell so many complex stories. I'm kind of comic book guy in here. Yeah. I, I apologize. No, no, this but, yeah. is totally wonderful to talk about. Um, so in the original footage, and if you do a Google search for Panjandrum, you'll see all this archival footage that we worked with. Um, they show them testing it on the shores of, uh, of England. And you see several different versions of what they tried as aiming systems, cables being driven by clutches and things mm-hmm. like that. And the main issue they had is without that, any time the panjandrum hit an irregular object, it would go up on one wheel and stay on one wheel. Oh, right, because the, yeah. But, right, and <clears throat> this, is the, this is the reason, this is the primary reason Stelt, Steltzner made the leap to push the two wheels close together. When you have them far apart, you end up with a lever arm. So as and there's a lot of energy keeping it wanting to move in its direction. But because the wheels are far apart, you've got this advantage of a lever. So when it goes over a high spot, it wants to stay there. So you move mm. the wheels closer together, you make that lever shorter, and you make the thing want to stay upright. So 
I don't agree that our rocket propelled one would have done any better than all the tests we see in the archival footage. But if we had put, if we had had time and energy and money to put rockets on two wheels closer together, we might have had a better result. This this seems like the kind of topic you could potentially revisit in the future if you wanted <laughs> yeah, to. Yeah, except that I don't want to revisit that one. <laughs> really, I feel like a, a whoo. Uh, I'll need, um, it, to be honest, if I was going to do that <clears> again, the only the, the, the difficulty with the rockets that we were working with is that they fired for much shorter periods of time than the vintage ones they were using in World War II. Um, so we'd probably have to go to some real custom uh, solid rocket motor design in order to make them exactly match both in terms of the output, which I think we got, but only on a kind of an impulse and for 10, for, 12 for the, seconds, as opposed meters, yeah. to like a minute and a half of solid, you know, 20 pounds of thrust per rocket or something Interesting. like that. Interesting. Um, you talked, okay, so this is a non but we talked, we talk about meditative, tedious work here a lot. Yeah. And that the wiring up of those igniters Isn't looked like delightful? the most tedious, best <laughs> kind of tedious work. Oh, so good. Um, how, how fast did, how long did it take you to do that? Do you I remember? Think somewhere over, somewhere just under an hour. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. Okay. So enough time that you can min max your speeds without exactly. going crazy. Okay. Um, and, to be honest, in the melee of making a television show, it's really nice to have this moment in time where it's like, nothing's going to happen for the next hour except this. Oh, let them set up a good time lapse and yeah. you're good. It's delightful. Yeah, it's like the weaving of the uh, the, the bullet. Yes, exactly. The, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, that one, oof. Um, that's it for me. I, I was gonna, I was gonna give you grief about the bandsaw holding the bandsaw on your legs, but I'm sure the internet probably already took care of that for you. <laughs> I don't read the comments, the so police, I don't know. The safety police are always there. <laughs> yeah, they've got their hands full with me, to be yeah. sure. And then Mad Max, that was the uh, the third episode, oh, dude. Uh, that I looks just, like so much, so much fun. Laura Kampf and Simone Yatch are just the most. <clears throat> so, there was an aspect of competing repeatedly with Jamie Heineman that was exhausting. And it was that Jamie was always trying to look at the language of the competition to figure out some way to bone you. He was going to rules lawyer you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Right. And that was always his approach. And he was a genius at that approach. Maru, but it time. meant that you could never just enjoy the contest for its own sake. Yeah, it's exhausting. You, there was always somebody going like, ah, I stuck a thing in your ribs or whatever. Yeah. And Simone and, and Laura were both so committed to exactly what we were doing, which was unfettered, ridiculous, ludicrous fun where smashy, smashy happens. Yeah. And we have this, you know, this absurd landscape we get to play in. Uh, and there's like... I loved watching it. I watched the I watched the episode with a bunch of the crew and Simone uh, and uh, uh, some other friends at Simone's shop last week. My daughter stood up and cheered at the end really? of the episode. Yeah, she was very excited. So awesome. Yeah, and yeah, I really did get hit in the nose by that thing. That and it really gave so me so painful. <laughs> Holy oh smokes! That PVC pipe. So I'll tell you one story. Um, that rig, that mm -hmm. that rig, the pop rig that was supposed to cover me with goo. Um, was designed and built by John Marcoux, who's one of the key builders on Savage Builds. And he's an amazing and incredible builder. Um, and when that thing hit me in the nose, my first thought was, what the hell just happened? Then yeah. the second thought was, oh, I got hit by the thing. Wow, that really, really hurt. Yeah. And now the whole crew is quietly staring at me because everyone's wondering how bad it is. And then I thought about John. And I realized, oh, man. John feels like shit right at this second. Oh, yeah. Because you don't, you want to build a rig, you don't want to hurt. When you build a rig that punches your boss in the nose. Yeah, no. <laughs> so the, they didn't cut it into the show, but after I went, ow, and I cursed, I went, John, I'm okay. <laughs> I took him off the hot seat because I knew exactly oh how God. he felt. I've sat in, I once built a, um, and then I, 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 after my nose healed up later on that day, I told him a story. So I did a baby gap commercial years yeah. ago uh, where a baby is sitting on a toboggan and has to a like a real baby, your real baby sitting on a little miniature toboggan for a target ad. And it has to go through the frame. And so that's it just has to fly, go through the frame. And the director was insane and insisted that if the baby giggled, he wanted it live. <laughs> and so he required us, Jamie and I, to build this toboggan sliding rig to be perfectly silent. 
Okay. So we used really expensive skateboard bearings in this track that was so sensitive and lightweight and silent that when we went for the first take and I just tugged on the cord, it broke, it it started so quickly that baby fell right off the back of the toboggan. <laughs> I have never felt worse in my oh, whole shit. life. So Luckily, baby, the baby was on the ground and the ba like, baby's head didn't cock the ground. Baby wow. was fine. Everything was cool. The parent was there. We dealt, we dealt with it. This is 20... Five years ago, uh, but yeah, wow. I knew exactly how John. And that felt. baby grew up to be Joseph Gordon-Levitt. <laughs> <laughs> so to say, if that baby still knows has who a it is. Soft spot. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I'm talking about talking about circumstantial things that you can't control. You guys had the robbery, and I was surprised though yeah. that was part of the story. Well, we had to make it part of the story. I, we literally like, yeah. So we showed up on the third day of that build, and uh, our shop had been busted into. It turned out at five o'clock that morning. And we had security tapes from somebody across the street. They were in and out of the shop in eight minutes flat. That's wow, really yeah. crazy. And they got away with something like forty grand worth of power tools and stuff. I'm, I'm I was really glad that they didn't take your electronics rack. Uh, actually, um, to be c totally clear, Marcos Ramirez lost the most personal tools in that robbery. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the tools we lost had arrived. I'm not kidding. Maybe five days before oh, from so Milwaukee. Ah, so yeah. they got an entire slate. They got an entire Milwaukee catalogs worth of tools. Wow. Um, I'm very grateful to say I lost very few personal tools that meant a lot to me. And I saw a lot of people tweeting, hoping that that was the case. And I, I appreciate people thinking like that. I mean, Laura says it in the episode, yeah. but like the tools that you use, you have a relationship with. It's true. And you, 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 you build that relationship over time. They've saved you out of certain jams. And yeah, and I, I was, once it started to sink into me, like I hugged that, that electronics kit. That was a spontaneous moment. I was literally looking around and I'm like, oh, this didn't get taken. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Real raw. Ooh, it, it, was, yeah. it sucked. It really sucked. Um, yeah. They stole our entire walkie talkie rental. Oh. So we had like 20 walkie talkies that whole that's like thirty thousand yeah, dollars right there ton of wow. it's, it's more ten thousand dollars I don't know what it is, but it was expensive it's more than 50 bucks less we, than 20, we had 000. one walkie left and My producer my showrunner John Tessier picked up that walkie and turned it on and he went hello and someone answered him <gasps> back What yeah, and he went where are you and they went who's this and he's like you've got my walkies and they went boop And oh. we never heard from them again <laughs> But they were within like wow. a mile of us for a little while. Before we continue on with this episode, I want to let you know that support for Still Untitled comes from Lightstream. You don't have to be a financial expert to know that consolidating debt into a low fixed rate can save you thousands in interest. So pay off your high interest credit cards with a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. You can get a rate as low as 5.95 APR with auto pay, which is much lower than the national average interest rate on credit card debt. And get a loan from $5,000 to $100,000 with absolutely no fees. The application is 100% online and you can get your money as soon as the day you apply. I have a bunch of credit cards. I have for work, for personal life, for all sorts of stuff. And yeah, it makes a lot of sense to get it all consolidated and managed under one umbrella. Apply today at lightstream.com slash untitled and get an additional interest rate discount. That's lightstream.com slash untitled for an additional discount. L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash untitled. Subject to credit approval, rate includes 0.5% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash untitled for more information. Now back to the conversation. And then the thing that really added texture to that episode was uh, the Wastelanders. Dude. They were so cool. Oh, my God. The Wastelanders were so awesome and so generous. And what a, like, a delightful hobby. Um, friend of Tested and my good friend Mark Duvo is a Wastelander. He goes every year. Uh, and always comes back with the most incredible pictures. And when we started working with those guys... Uh, they just brought so much extra production value and energy to the shoot. I I can't yeah. I couldn't believe I'd never heard of them before. 
Right. I thought I was pretty dialed into like the cosplay yeah. universe, but holy cow, the work that they've done on those cars is incredible. And that's the, there's like two clips in the show where I talked to two different car makers. Oh, how mm-hmm. long did this take you? But I did that with all like 12 cars. It took me an hour to yeah. work through conversing with every single car maker. Um, the amazing woman who has that huge, huge sword. samurai oh. sword, yeah. she's a lawyer. That's her day job <laughs> in that's L.A. Um, the the one somebody made a car out of what looked like an old Cessna cockpit or maybe a beach yeah, beach, yeah. beach air cockpit something like that so cool yeah like just unbelievable um it was it was the highest degree of the highest gulf of these people looked terrifying and every last one of them was a sweetheart like you just you know when we're shooting the when we're shooting the sequence in the beginning where they're circling me. Yeah. There was this one old dude who had like, you know, was holding onto a machine gun. And for the entire time he was circling me, which was about an hour while we were getting all of our drone shots and all of our pickup shots, he never broke eye contact. And I found that so wow. disturbing. <laughs> I mean, if they're going to live a whole week and that's yeah. all, they, 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 they came inhabit to play, the man. characters yeah. for a full week on location in their little uh, their, their city. Yeah. Right. So we like, should include a link to yeah, the Wasteland Weekend down absolutely. here in the comments. Yeah. yeah. I mean, do, do they? Did you shoot this during their like com- negative? Okay. You no, just, we shot they, this you, off you got season. Them to come out off season. Okay. Um, and in fact, again, talking about the rain, the day we shot was the only day it didn't rain wow. in like ten oh, wow. days there in the desert. In the desert. In the desert. Yeah. So it stopped raining two days before we arrived which meant that the ground dried up enough to film, and then it didn't rain the day we were filming. And that night, I was actually planning to take my cruiser to LA and see some friends and have some meetings. And like as we were wrapping, we were looking at the Doppler and watching this massive storm oh, coming yeah. in. And I decided, you know what, in a Land Cruiser, driving in the pouring rain is is even more tiring than just driving a Land Cruiser. So I hightailed it back to San Francisco, and I was home by like 2.30 that morning. What, what um... Yeah, the, the the that 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 frustrating. The weather's got to be really frustrating. I, I just want to shout out Duncan. Does your drone work right? Still, dude. He, holy cow! Yeah. The shots from that episode. The shots from the Panjandrum episode. Did I get it right. The, the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Panjandrum. Panjandrum. Well done. Yeah, nice. But that long shot of the shop oh. coming down through the door. So, so good. D- Duncan has Duncan started out on MythBusters as an intern in God. What has to be like season four or five. Um, became a second camera op, had a passion for drones. He's he's a legacy cameraman. His dad is a is an IMAX cameraman of great renown. Um, and he started early putting together his own drone yeah. systems. Uh, he uh, for escape from Duct Tape Canyon. Those drone shots were shot by a fixed wing airplane mm. that he had a camera on, and we mm-hmm. actually lost that plane in the river at one point. Ooh, oh boy! So Duncan has a tremendous amount of experience. He's a, the earliest of adopters in that technology. And again, while we were filming on MythBusters, he would come in on the weekends. Like I'd go to the shop to do something, and I'd find him there doing drone shots of M5 and asking, like, you know is there stuff I should be looking at here? And we talked about narratives and we talked about what doesn't work with other people's drone shots. And I mean, he's just dedicated himself to understanding how to tell stories with this brand new technology without calling attention to the technology itself. Well, that's the toughest part. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Watch those documentaries and I'm a drone is what so many documentaries seem to be saying. Yep. Well, yeah, the, the, I remember we talked to him once when he was building his first Octo, which I think was to carry a 5d Mark three or something. Maybe. Yeah. And and he was he was really, really excited about it, but like clearly still figuring out a lot of what was important and like what was and and the shots that he's coming up with on this show are spectacular. Just really astounding. We um we made the decision early on uh, and this was stemmed from Scott Sorensen, my A camera, who's been my A camera for years now. And again, he also started out on Mythbusters, I think, in season three uh, as an intern Um, is that Scott wanted this to have a even more cinematic look than the last couple of seasons of Mythbusters. So almost no zoom lenses in the entire shoot. All primes. Wow. Pretty much everything yeah. was shot with primes. Wow. There's a great shot in the Mad Max episode that looks like it's 
almost looks like it's green screen, like a composite, but it right. very evokes that kind of Mad Max. I think it's like one of the Wastelanders yelling and yes. a, a, a profile shot. Yeah, um, loved it. Just to be clear, for the non-camera buffs among you, when I say we shot with primes, that means we shot with fixed focal length lenses. And as opposed to zooms, these tend to be able to have a much wider aperture, which means you can get that cinematic depth of field where the main character is in the front of the frame and the background is blurry or the lights are blurry. That is, uh, shooting with prime lenses is one of the main ways you get that look. Um, I was going to say, are, are the, do they, can they drive those cars on the street? Uh, some, some of them too? can and some, some of them can't. Can. Can. Okay. Uh, one of them was like, yeah, I can drive it in the street. I've got to remove the flamethrower. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, last, last question I have is where do you go if you want to get 50 gallons of, um, of, oh, uh, of <laughs> animal, animal birthing fluid? So you get it at the wonderful Mr. S. Leathers. Okay. Here in San Francisco, a uh, re- world-renowned fetish supplier of all sorts of different items, no matter what your kink, I think they've got you covered, okay. um, is owned by an old friend of mine. Uh, and Mythbusters has been shopping there for years. Yeah. Um, so we sent uh, one of my producers, Brooke, we sent her husband uh, from Atlanta, who's from Atlanta, down to Mr. S to pick up animal birthing lubricant. And he, he went in and just walking into Mr. S Leathers is itself like a kind of moment visually yeah. you, know, you, you just realize the, there are things there's a you, the, your understanding of the things that you don't know anything about expands dramatically the moment you walk into that <laughs> store nice. you know when you walk into a kitchen where someone's cooking and you can't take shallow breaths you have to take a deep yeah. breath to take yeah. in the intense scent yeah right mr mr s leathers is the visual equivalent of that yeah you walk in and you're like whoa hey so we sent Brooke's husband in, and he said, I would like to buy um, 10 bottles of powdered animal birthing lubricant. And they were like, they make five gallons each. And he's like, yeah, that sounds about right. And they go, why don't you just buy this? And he goes, no, I, I want all this stuff. And they said, how many insertions are you expecting? <laughs> That's a perfectly reasonable question. Uh, and now he knows um, how to be thrifty with lube. My my favorite, <laughs> my favorite uh, on that front was Norm and I were going to buy something from somebody that you had recommended we go pick something up at. I don't remember what it was, but when we got in there, and I, I had the specific ask, and they were like, Are, "Do you work on MythBusters?" <laughs> black powder, I bet. It was, it was a buster in black powder. Yeah. 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 Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. The very gloves of No Face behind me here in this shot the, are arm mm-hmm. length satin lo- satin gloves. And when I was putting that together, I was like, "Where am I going to find arm length satin gloves?" And then I remembered, oh, the yeah. Drag Queen Supply Store here in the Mission Lucky Lady, which is now sadly closed. I walked right in there, and I was like. Do you have arm length black gloves? And they're like, what do you want? Matte, shiny, or gloss? <laughs> nice. <laughs> we got a um we got a latex nurse's costume there once for a thing that we did at uh, Maximum PC. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. The last anyway, thing I want to talk stuff. about <laughs> is I was just thinking about Norm Blush. <laughs> I I'm trying to remember when was this. No, no, they, no. They, it was before your time. Yeah. There was a store that used to have the inflatable sheep in their front window and it, it the brand name for an inflatable sheep was the Love You. you yeah. Uh, very good. Walk a walk. Very good. <laughs> uh, one last thing, unrelated to Savage Builds, but it was announced last week. There's a project that you've been working on with uh, now your shop assistant, Jen Schachter. Jen Schachter, and yes. We project alluded egress. to this that when she was on the podcast last, and we'll definitely have her back on in the future to talk about it. Project Egress. Project Egress. So uh, uh, the Smithsonian uh, scanned the Apollo command module. Uh, and you can go and visit that scan in glorious 3D, stitched together by the people at Auto, uh, IDEO? Uh, IDEO. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, and it's really amazing. They discovered things about the uh, command module that they didn't even know, handwriting from the astronauts that no one had seen before and stuff like that. And they, ha- they had scanned, but there was no data on the hatch. And Tested started to talk to the Smithsonian about this hatch scan data, and they, they let us have it. Uh, this is a few months ago now. And then Andrew Barth, Andrew Barth. Yes. I'm a, yes, yes. Andrew Barth, uh, is a student and genius with the CAD who took that scan and turned it into 
a, a detailed 3D model of the entire command module hatch, all of the working parts, all of the linkages, including even reaching out to the Smithsonian to find out that they still had diagrams of the internal gearbox of how it operated. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he built all of that into the drawing. And Jen and I uh, seeded that out to over 40 makerspaces around the world. Uh, Bill Duran is one of them. All sorts of different people. Uh, Sean, Kate, yeah, a lot of familiar oh, awesome. names. Yeah, tons also, a lot of people, people you know work and with love from Nation of Makers. And, from yeah. Nation of Makers, and each person has been building a specific part. Um, all they have to do is build it to the exact size of the original. We don't care what color or material it's in, so it's going to be a calico. Oh, so it's it's like it's like the it's like the Rosie the Riveter exactly, you, except they're but, discrete pieces. Right, 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 right. So wow, that's in, amazing. Yeah. So it is a collaborative reconstruction of the command module hatch and all of its mechanicals that will go on display at the Smithsonian this summer as part of the Apollo 50th oh, celebration. That's amazing. That's but so you'll cool. be there with Jen. I will be to there. Assemble. Right. So again, all of these parts are now currently now many of them are on their way to the Smithsonian. We're going to meet them there and do a live assembly on the floor of the Smithsonian. Yeah, that's July 18th. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I hope it goes great. <laughs> <laughs> There'll Jen be a video. Just, we're, we're just currently putting together the toolkit we need for all the different contingencies we might encounter on our way. I can't even imagine how you pack for that that kind of trip. Uh, I don't know either. I mean, one of the coolest things is that because it's a collaboration that's different than like the traditional We the Builders, the Rosie the Riveter, mm -hmm. um, they're not just 3D prints. Everyone's manufacturing their piece in a little, a little different way based on their expertise and their links. There's a blog post on the site right now. I'll include it in the, the podcast show notes, but it has a link to all the different builders, and a lot of them have been sharing their builds already. Like I know, Ryan, I'm God retweeting been, a ton of it, and, and so you can see, yeah, like the pieces come together in completely different ways. Did Bill make his out of foam? I, I don't think so. Okay. Um, and then uh, the the base of it, the base door frame and window, and the stand that that sits on is being built by my new best friends over at the Microsoft Product Design uh, Shop, which is one of the greatest toy stores I have ever been lucky enough to visit. Um, next week, we'll shoot a... Sh when I visited the Microsoft Design facilities, they were gracious enough to make me a gift, um, uh, uh, an incredible rendering of the Savage Industries logo. We'll do a show and tell on yeah. this for Tested because you got to see it. We, let's not spoil that. No, it's, it's, because yeah. this is one of the most intense and delightful playgrounds I've ever stepped into. I I have to assume like there are a handful of shops that Norman and I have been to, and I, I know you've been to a bunch that are just like they have access to all the tools and also incredibly smart people to 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 work them and build the stuff. And add to that, who are encouraged to think as far outside of the box as they really want. Yeah. So what you what I found as I met, and I I spent only a half day there. I'm I'm going to go back hopefully in the next couple months to spend more time. Um, the energy of people who are doing a job that they love and feel valued for doing and also feel like they can contribute to is just impossible to overestimate how good it feels to be in a room like that. It's places where people, it's the, those are the places where people make the future. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Yeah. Uh, it was thrilling. Uh, so that's awesome. The, the, this whole project, Project Egress, by the way, Jen Schachter came up with that name. Perfect. And I love it. Uh, the reason the hatch has all of the mechanicals on it was specifically because of the Apollo 1 fire that famously killed Gus Grissom and two other astronauts. It's an absolute tragedy. And immediately in the wake of that, NASA required a new hatch be uh, engineered that could get the astronauts out as fast as humanly possible. Right, one that they can open from the inside That they as could well, open right? from the inside. Yeah. Uh, and this was the solution. And it, it's an amazing piece of engineering, especially when you see it up close. Fascinating. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, me too. Um, um, in addition, the files, and this is in our, we'll include a link to this. The files are all open source, public domain. The one that Andrew designed. The you one Andrew designed. So the Smithsonian oh. has those files, the yeah. entire STLs for the entire hatch. That's awesome. Are on the Smithsonian's website. We'll put a link down yeah. here below this. Uh, you can download it and build your own full scale if you want to, although that might be a little unwieldy for yeah. many people. Yeah. I'll wager some yeah. somebody's going to... Somebody will do it, yeah. It's going to be Daryl, right? It's going to be the broken nerd. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Just probably. devote a machine for like a month just to printing out little chunks of parts. Exactly, and... exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's next on what's next what's going on you got stuff on the site this week Norm? yeah I mean it's July 4th week uh, so happy July 4th happy pride for everyone who celebrated this happy, past oh, yeah, pride. we live um, in the mission uh, we're in the mission district where the sounds of 
pride were so delightful all weekend long. Um, and, you know, we're, you're in July now, so we're getting close to that 50th anniversary of Apollo landing. So wow. a lot of related content coming up for that. Uh, we, Errol and I did an interview with Poppy Northcutt, um, oh. and she was in-house, so we have an off-world episode coming up later this week. Um, but just a lot of cool stuff. Excellent. And um, that also means that I... The 50th anniversary celebration stuff in D.C. means that I personally will not be going to Comic-Con this year for the first time in over a wow. dozen years. Yeah. Uh, I will be in D.C., but uh, I will be back in the con game at uh, Silicon, Silicon Valley, Valley Comic-Con Comic -Con in uh, August, late in August. August. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be at Comic-Con. I'm Norm not going to be, be at Comic-Con. Comic -Con. <laughs> I'm fine. You know who's going to Comic-Con this year? Who? Lin-Manuel Miranda. <gasps> really? Yes! Well, this is your chance. Yeah. Why would he go the one you year should, I'm not going? I was like, like oh, well, offer him a costume. We could walk the... Oh, I'm not going to be there. You should You <laughs> should it. invite him to come and present on this, you know, do the stage something, you know. Sir, what was that? Space stuff. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Ixnay on oh, the... So. Just cut the... Just, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, what's up on Savage Builds this week, Adam? Uh, you know what? I don't know what the fourth episode is. We'll have to is. wait and see. What an asshole. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is very awkward I've been now. on vacation. Yeah, you caught me out. Yeah. I've got my pants down. Yeah, I, I assume you're going to build something, though. I'm pretty sure I'm going to build something. And we'll try and to do our be best to, to talk about it next week. <laughs> as do you well. want to redo that? <laughs> Oh, this, this is, we really crapped the bed on this wow. wrap up. Nailed the, <laughs> nailed the promotion work this week, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, See mom. you all next week. 10 p.m. Discovery, Friday night. <laughs> Thanks, Norm. <laughs>